Okay, so it's time. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this side event on efficiency and fairness in criminal investigations, practical training tools, which is organized by the UNODC uh, Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Section in the Division for Treaty Affairs, together with the permanent missions of Norway and the Federal Republic of Germany and the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. My name is Anna Giudice, I lead the team on access to justice and police reform uh, in the section and I'll be moderating today's event. I would like to mention that the event will be recorded and we will use the recording on our website uh, and that you can ask questions in the question and answer uh, function of the Zoom webinar. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor for opening remarks to three senior officials and I would like to start with uh, Mr. John Brandolino, the Director of the Division for Treaty Affairs at UNODC. John, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. And welcome, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of UNODC to this side event entitled Efficiency and Fairness in Criminal Investigations, Practical Training Tools. And also thanks to the permanent missions of Germany and Norway, the Norwegian Center for Human Rights and Crime Prevention, and the, the, and the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice section at UNODC for its, uh, its organize, organization of this event. At last year's Crime Congress in Kyoto, member states adopted, of course, the Kyoto Declaration on Advancing Crime Prevention, Criminal Justice, and the Rule of Law. And in paragraph 47 of that declaration, which covers improving criminal investigation processes, member states encourage, and I quote, the use and the sharing of good practices on legally grounded evidence-based interviewing methods designed to obtain only voluntary statements, thereby reducing the risk of unlawful, abusive, and coercive measures being used during criminal investigation processes and enable the obtaining of best evidence, thereby improving the legitimacy and quality of criminal investigations, prosecutions, and convictions, and the efficient use of resources. And the tools and projects presented during this side event respond to that commitment made by member states as we are continuing to build a strong evidence base on what works for efficient investigations and interviewing. And UNODC has longstanding experience in supporting member states in setting standards, developing technical tools, and providing assistance to member states to implement those standards in the area of policing. We provide assistance to requesting member states in the area of police reform, including on evidence and intelligence-led policing and investigate, interviewing techniques and investigating techniques. In 2021, the Secretary General decided to establish a UN Interagency Task Force on Policing, which UNRDC has the honor to co-chair together with the Department of Peace Operations. And the task force will help ensure that policing assistance provided by the UN is in line with and promotes international human rights and UN standards and norms in crime prevention and criminal justice, and that the UN continues to provide the highest quality products and guidance and assistance to member states. Improving policing and investigating is key to reaching goal 16 of the sustainable development goals and to ensure that we leave no one behind by ensuring access to justice and protection of human rights for all. And so by continuous our continuous efforts to advance the evidence-based approach to policing, we collectively can reach those goals. Again, I'd like to thank the permanent missions of Norway and Germany and the Norwegian Center for Human Rights for organizing the event with us. And we look forward to the statements of the senior officials and the experts here today. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, Mr. Brandolino. And I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Jan Austad, Specialist Director at the Ministry of Justice and Public Security of Norway. Thank you so much. And uh, let me express my gratitude to the UNODC and partners for organizing this event. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is high time that we discuss closer the way communication takes place within our criminal justice systems. Do we have a sufficient critical approach to current institutional cultures? Well, our criminal justice systems 
are tasked with dealing with many acts of brutality towards and disregard for other people. And this all too often seems to find its reflection in the way that judges, lawyers, prosecutors and police behave towards suspects, witnesses and victims. Instead of a calm and respectful approach, there is often an air of aggression in interview rooms and courts. Luckily, we are on track to confront this situation. With the development of the Mendes principles, there is no turning back. In the years to come, we must see a forceful drive to put this set of international guidelines into practice worldwide. Reading the pr principles, one is in many ways struck by the fact that they only seem to state the obvious, yet we know that to start following them will be a total game-changing exercise in many institutions. And today we will mark the development of a most welcome tool for such game-changing, a tool for training, which is fully in line with principle four from Mendes, underlining that effective interviewing is a professional undertaking requiring specific training. It is indeed important to focus on training for law enforcement officers, while also remembering that there are strong cultural connections within criminal justice systems. So understanding the need for change must penetrate into the political level to bureaucracies, prosecution services and courts. And again, as a principal state, authorities must develop robust national measures to make implementation possible. As Mr. Brandolino mentioned, last year the international community took a large step in the right direction by including a paragraph on improving criminal investigation processes into the Kyoto Declaration. It was interesting to note during negotiations the opposition to the wording of what became paragraph 47, in many cases based on uncertainty about the results of the on ongoing elaboration of a set of international guidelines and also a fear of the consequences of introducing new methods of investigation. Only weeks after the Kyoto Declaration, the Mendes principles were adapted, and there is now no longer any uncertainty about the contents of the guidelines and no excuse for countries for not considering them. We welcome the critical approach to the principles. We support future discussions about them, and such a discussion must be led by an understanding of the foundation and reach of the principles and of the positive experiences from countries that have implemented them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alster. And I would like to now give the floor to Mr. Jürgen Gerdeler, who is uh, from the Division of Criminal Law at the Ministry, Federal Ministry of Justice of Germany. Thank you. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished colleagues, it is a very great pleasure to me today to give you a very warm, and it's a very warm welcome indeed, uh, from Vienna today, together with my colleague Susanne Medrich, and with our friends and colleagues from Norway and the UNODC, um, on behalf of the Federal Ministry of Justice of Germany, to this very important exchange today. The victim, the witness, and of course also the accused himself are the most important sources of the truth or what, or what might or might not be the truth in criminal proceedings and investigations. I used to be a state prosecutor myself uh, for several years and I can remember very well the difficulties that you can have uh, when you are questioning witnesses. For example, their observations or memories might change from their first interrogation until the final court proceedings. This can be especially the case if there is a lot at stake, a serious crime, for example, or a background of uh, organized crime, crime, and especially if there is a lot of pressure lasting on the witness, be it by the accused and his mates, be it by the social surrounding of the witness, be it by the law enforcement agencies. But we are all obliged on the truth, on the real truth. And therefore, we need a reliable testimony, especially to avoid wrong convictions. 
I'm therefore very thankful uh, that our experts have developed uh, interrogation, interrogation tools for um, the questioning of witnesses, uh, victims and accused, and that they're presenting today uh, a tool for us, um, a training tool to apply this um, interrogation techniques based on human rights compliant methodology and uh, science based. I think this is a very great step forward. Um, and again, I thank you for presenting today to us and wish, our, uh, wish us all a very interesting discussion today. Thank you all for attending and participating in this discussion. Thank you so much. So without further ado, after these three important opening uh, remarks, we will go into the expert presentations. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Maria Mahmoud, Senior Superintendent and Director for In-Service Training at the National Police Academy of Pakistan. Uh, Senior Superintendent Mahmoud, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank UNODC and all its partners for giving me this opportunity to talk about police training. As um, I have been associated with uh, the training academy for the last two years, um, I have seen that uh, the process of learning and training and refresher courses cannot be emphasized as um, more but we need to emphasize upon it. And uh, on the 29th of March, we were able to partner with the UNODC Pakistan to launch the e-learning program. Uh, which uh, envisages a lot of online courses and enables a lot of police officers, especially the experienced ones, to go back to their learning process and um, uh, equip themselves with a lot of um, hardcore policing skills. As uh, we saw in the piloting uh, of this and launching of this program on 29th March, we were able to see that a lot of police officers who attended uh, this uh, training program appreciated uh, the skill that it brought to uh, their skill set. And um, we have seen as a part of the training that uh, there are two primary challenges that we face. Uh, and one of them is uh, the distance that we have to face that a lot of field officers, once they are um, on their different assignments in the field operations, they are unable to come to the academy. And even if they do it uh, is either once a year or twice a year. So they hardly get any opportunities to improve upon their skill set when it comes to uh, police work and especially in this domain of uh, investigative interviewing we have seen that uh, with the global shift of a lot of uh, modern techniques in policing and interviewing the criminals not only the criminals but victims witnesses we have seen that there is a gradual shift from the traditional methods to modern methods and one thing that we found very difficult to implement here in Pakistan was this paradigm shift that even though the will was there, we did not have the tools. So I'm very glad to see that now we have been equipped with the, these tools with the help of UNODC. So uh, as I look at it in the near future, we would be able to not only resolve the issue of the officers not being able to come all the way from the different parts of the country to Islamabad to the academy and while sitting at their own um, in their own offices or in their own uh, police formations they would be able to access this course. I'm also very glad that the National Police Academy will um, in turn uh, take this opportunity to uh, launch this e-learning program and be a bridge between all the other police training schools and colleges all across the country because um, sitting as a federal organization, the police academy is in a better position to connect with all the different police school colleges and would be able to train all the uh, police officers in the far-flung areas. Having said that, I cannot also emphasize more upon uh, the skill that is required for the modern criminal investigative methods. And um, also, if we are to uphold human rights and if we are to see that there are no human rights violations, we have to actually start our journey towards these modern methods. And uh, having uh, conducted the course once on 29th of March, I have seen that the police officers seemed very satisfied and they were glad that they could actually not only uphold the human rights and avoid human rights violations during the different investigations, they would also be equipping themselves with the 
uh, different methods that have been outlined in the different courses. We also look at the e-learning program in a futuristic perspective of um, uh, just seeing and uh, having a look at the different courses, which would be, um, there are different uh, categories and some of them are uh, actually related to a lot of specialized crime like white collar crime or anti-money laundering. And then there are specific uh, hardcore uh, policing topics as well. So we also look at these topics in a way that we would be looking for specialized police form formations for the uh, specialized um, areas and for the day-to-day -day police work we will be contacting and reaching out to all the experienced police officers because it is our understanding that uh, it is not only the pre-service training that is important to the police officers but also the training that after putting in 10 to 15 years of um, police work uh, into their service and being mid-career managers they usually face a lot of uphill task of um, uh, facing the challenging challenges and how to uh, go about them. So as I see it, this e-learning program uh, is a very uh, welcome thing in our local context because um, had it been for us, it would have taken us so many more years to come up with such e-learning program. And um, I really look forward to engaging more with this e-learning program. And this will also bridge the gap between practice and training, and it will enable more police officers uh, to undergo the training. Uh, so at the end, I'm again thankful that uh, we could be a part of this platform and I can see that uh, already the, um, a lot of people are reaping the fruits of this e-learning program. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I would also like to thank you for hosting the pilot uh, in Islamabad, especially that it, was, it happened to happen in the middle of quite a sensitive moment uh, in the country. And we're sorry that we were not able to visit you at that occasion, but we're hoping to come and visit you for the uh, launch of the localized version of the e-learning modules. So yes, thank you thank again you. for participating. I will now uh, present and effectively uh, launch the modules. Uh, so I'm switching hats to my presentation hat. Um, just, yes, presenting. So this will be a short presentation uh, on our work in, uh, in the uh, area of police reform and specifically the focus will be of course on the uh, e-learning uh, modules. I'm just, yeah. Can you see my screen? I just want, yeah. Thank you. So just to give you the broader picture of this work on, on the e-learning modules on investigative interviewing, they are placed within the framework of UNODC's global e-learning program and our work on police reform and access to justice. We see uh, investigative interviewing as a method that can very well um, contribute to human rights space and gender sensitive policing and long-term sustainable and nationally owned police reform. Of course, this is not the only method that you need to implement, but it is a key one that can help both increasing the efficiency and the human rights respect of investigations and interviewing and the efficiency of then the whole criminal justice process as it should produce better evidence for the cases of the prosecution and the court uh, sessions. So within the police reform uh, area, we strive also to have an evidence-based and data-driven approach when we support countries. And again, you will hear more later about why investigative interviewing is indeed an evidence-based methodology. We work on police reform from a strategic point of view, so supporting countries that develop their own strategies toward police reform, which we know takes time and has to be built on national constituencies of reform. We provide support in legislative and policy uh, as advice, uh, providing review of legislation and, and draft policies. We also support uh, police services and ministries of interior in human resources and management of uh, financial management also resources. Uh, strengthening of internal and external oversight and accountability institutions, which are again key both for efficiency and for human rights. 
And training and mentoring is, of course, a large part of many of our programs. Uh, we try to invest in long-term training. So working with national training and institutions is key and, and working on strengthening national training capacity through development of tools and mentoring of trainers and mentoring of police themselves. And finally, as our key function to support countries in, develop, in implementing international standards, we develop guidance materials and tools both at the global level and at the national country level. And the e-learning, of course, is a core aspect of that. Some uh, examples of tools and publications that we have in the policing area, the Criminal Justice Assessment Toolkit, the Education for Justice modules on policing, the Handbook on Police Accountability, Oversight and Integrity, and the UNODC OHCHR resource book on the use of force and firearms in law enforcement, all key to human rights and effective policing. So now to go to the uh, e-learning modules, which is the core of this uh, presentation, you will find on the chat already or soon a form that you can fill out if you're interested in these e-learning modules. They are currently being finalized, which means that they are almost ready and available, but they will be ready at the end of this month. What we have developed together with the Norwegian Center for Human Rights is three modules that represent a full course on investigative uh, uh, interviewing. Uh, the first module um, is an introductory module to investigative interviewing. It um, Sorry, it outlines the main steps of an investigative interview and explores how investigative interviewing relates to human memory, communication, human rights, and principles of fair trial. Module two provides the first part of the step-to-step, step-by-step guide to guide to investigative interviewing. So it explore module two explores planning and preparation, introduction and building rapport, initial and initial account while module three uh, continues the step-by-step -step part, exploring clarification and disclosure of evidence, closure of the interview and evaluation of the interview. Each of the uh, e-learning modules are estimated to take 70 minutes to complete. And these are for individual uh, e-learning uh, sessions that you do on your own computer. We've noticed, however, when we did the pilots that this 70 minutes can vary. So for some users, it may take longer, of course, also depending on bandwidth and other uh, aspect, technical aspects. Um, each of the modules have a pre and a post test, which measure the transfer of knowledge. So the learning experience uh, in each of the modules. We use the latest pedagogical approaches with several dynamic features and exercises. And you will see in a minute, a short video that shows how the uh, e-learning modules look and feel. Uh, participants will receive a certificate of completion at the end. Uh, and we are, as I said, the English version will be ready at the end of this month. And at the end of June, we hope to have French, Arabic, Russian and Spanish available. And of course, then, with resources, there is always a possibility to do localization in other languages. And we've heard already about interest in Pakistan and in other parts uh, of the world. We are just to give you a quick idea of other aspects of this project that we're implementing with the Norwegian Center, with the support of the Norwegian Center and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We're also developing three additional mini modules. Uh, an interactive online platform for law enforcement academies together with colleagues in UNODC and a tool for monitoring and evaluation uh, of uh, with for a baseline survey before starting police reform efforts. And I will just show give you our contact. So whoever is interested in the e-learning can contact me or one of the generic email addresses. And I would like to now ask uh, my colleague to show the video that explains or gives you an introduction to the e-learning.
Yes, there is no sound. It's just a video with images. So you give, get an impression of how the e-learning looks. This being uh, module one, I believe. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin, and thank you, colleagues. Um, I think people are asking for the contacts. We'll share them again in the chat so that you have them for those who would like to follow up. And before, uh, well, without uh, taking more time, I will now ask uh, Ms. Uh, Suzanne Flelo, advisor uh, for rule of law at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights to speak on the emerging international standard on interviewing and investigations. Suzanne, please. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by thanking you so much for this uh, incredible opportunity, both for me personally and for the Norwegian Center for Human Rights to provide this uh, brief intervention on the emerging international standard on interviewing and investigations. The emerging standard, which I will be referring to for the next uh, five minutes or so, comes in the form of practical guidance and principles being endorsed by states, manuals guiding UN operations and technical assistance, and training manuals, the materials being offered to individual police, intelligence, and the security services at the state level. At present, the standard rests on four pillars. One, the principles on effective interviewing for investigations and information gathering, or perhaps better known as the Mendes principles. These principles are primarily addressed to uh, policymakers and authorities in charge of designing, adopting, and uh, executing policies on interviewing and related justice processes. The other three pillars we consider primarily as tool for, tools for practitioners, namely, the uh, forthcoming UN Manual on Effective Interviewing, which is co-owned by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN Police Division. Three, the UNODC Manual on Investigative Interviewing, the Right to Remain Silent and the Prohibition of Torture. And last but certainly not least, and the main reason for this event, the soon forthcoming UNODC e-learning course on investigative interviewing. The Council of Europe's Committee for the Prevention of Torture has already set a standard for its 47 member states. And last year, the UN Committee Against Torture started referring to the Mendes Principle in its recommendations to states. These pillars combined aim to form a standard that offers practical and positive guidance on how to achieve fairness and efficiency in investigations and information gathering. And it's multi-sectoral in scope. It cuts across human rights, the rule of law, criminal justice, security, counterterrorism, and migration. By merging principles of law, ethics, and practice, it offers states, law enforcement, and security services an opportunity to operationalize the principles of fair trial and increase the efficiency and accuracy of evidence gathering and presentation while pre pre preventing the use of torture. We would argue that an international standard for how to interview and investigate crime and gather information already exists and that the standard will guide states in their efforts to enhance human rights compliance, the rule of law, and public trust. It will minimize the risks of errors of justice and torture in police custody. Criminal justice, public security, and the rule of law will likely never be perfect, but there is no need for mistakes to be made because of immoral 
coercive or ineffective methods, which both decades of experience and scientific re research have informed us do not work and are in fact counterproductive. I do hope I don't offend anyone with the claim I'm about to make, but a lot of, if not most, human rights training for law enforcement and the security sector in the past has left agencies with a lot of guidance about what not to do, rather than teaching applicable practice. And the latter is what this uh, standard, standard set out to ensure. I would suppose that in this audience, most of you read the news, have a streaming service, or some sort of a social media account, which may have given you an indication that the public's patience with the use of torture, errors of justice, and mistrials is running extremely low. The documented inefficiency of coercive methods and shortcuts leaves no room for excuses and has changed the conversation on torture and on errors of justice. We are witnessing and the people are witnessing how bad practices lead to bad information, which leads to bad decision-making in cases which are crucial to public security, while at the same time damaging people's trust in our institutions. When law enforcement and security agencies adopt the international standard, they enhance accountability and public trust. Most services around the world already receive ample training and education in shooting, marching, and driving, to name a few, while not much attention is given to training and education to communicate with sus suspects, victims, and witnesses of crime, how to utilize and secure evidence, and investigative thinking and decision-making. The public has the right to expect that custodians of the state monopoly and violence performed their mandate in accordance with the researched and documented best practice, the principles of uh, fair trial and the rule of law. And in addition, law enforcement and other investigative actors deserve to be provided with training and education in methods and tools that will assist them to ensure efficient and fair investigations. Both the state, the public and the police as a professional group want to get it right. And we all need the knowledge, methods, tools, and systems to ensure that we do. Transparent and accessible methods permit evaluation and assessment internally and publicly. They make it possible for authorities to understand how mistakes are made, communicate with the public, and remedy and improve practice. Adversely, secrecy often hides a lack of methods and destroys public trust in uh, state agencies' professionalism. The detrimental effect of transnational organized crime is a challenge which we know required, requires a coordinated response from the international community. As long as law enforcement and security agencies use widely different and undocumented methods when uh, gathering information and evidence, mutual legal assistance and effective cooperation across jurisdictions will ultimately suffer. The good news is that uh, effective interviewing and information gathering practices are now accessible, understandable, and at least affordable. Changing practices requires law enforcement and security agency to, agencies to switch mindset so that investigations are led from evidence to suspect rather than from suspect to evidence. In essence, I would like to uh, conclude with that. Uh, law enforcement and security Security cannot be efficient without being fair, and they cannot be fair without being efficient. And it's difficult to be both uh, fair and efficient if we do not have methods which embed core human rights principles and are considered an effective resource by the people who are expected to use and to implement them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I would like to now give the floor to our last speaker and just remind participants, if you would like to ask questions, you can use the question and answer function. So our last but not least speaker is uh, Pro Assistant Professor Lennart May uh, from the Medical School in Berlin, Germany. He will speak on uh, whether investigative interviewing could help to ensure and increase the efficiency of investigations in Germany. Uh, Lennart, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the German and Norwegian UN missions, UNODC and the Norwegian Center for Human Rights for organizing what I think is a very relevant side event. Please give me the opportunity to briefly introduce myself and explain why I am allowed to make a contribution here today. 
I'm an assistant professor for legal psychology in Berlin, and in my research, I focus in particular on interviewing and statements of suspects. I also work as an expert witness, writing credibility assessments on sexual offenses and homicide cases for courts and prosecutors, and develop an interactive interviewing training for the police and legal ex experts in Germany. So I would like to outline my insights, experiences, and knowledge based on my research, expert reports, and interviewing trainings here today. And the title of my presentation and the question I would like to explore or answer is, can investigative interviewing help to ensure and increase the efficiency of investigations in Germany? And when I try to answer these questions, I will focus um, especially on suspect interviews. So almost 10 years ago, when I started my research on interviewing during my PhD in Sweden, I realized that internationally, there are many research findings from police, psychology, and law on the subject of interviewing. Research is important in this context as the chances and risks of different techniques or tactics need to be examined. What do I mean with this? Let me give you an example from another field. Let's imagine you're sick and you have to go to the hospital. I guess you don't want the doctor in that hospital to unknowingly give you a medication that has not been tested or is proven to be dangerous or harmful. I mean, no one wants an ineffective medication. And that's very similar with interview tactics. Usually no one wants to be interviewed with ineffective tactics that can lead you to say things you didn't experience, you don't know, or you don't want to say. And when we look on research on suspect interviews, for example, researchers have found that suggestive, uh, confrontational, and manipulative confession-oriented tactics increase the risks of false confessions and should therefore be rejected. With these tactics, interviewers often want to confirm their subjective belief that the suspect is guilty, even though this feeling could be also incorrect when there is a lack of relevant evidence. Let's describe these tactics here as ineffective tactics. Information gathering tactics, on the other hand, are, for example, an open-ended interview strategy, open-ended questions, and a non-judgmental presentation of inconsistencies. And these elements increase the chance of gathering reliable information. And for efficient investigations, we need these reliable information. So let us describe them as effective tactics. These effective tactics are also recommended by the Mendes principles for the normative level, as Susanna described, and are part of investigative interviewing, which you can find, for example, also in the CTI training tool. However, during my first credibility assessments, um, I noticed that little of these international findings were reflected in the interview transcripts in Germany. I can't talk about my own cases due to confidentiality here, but please give me the opportunity to give you a short case example. In 2001, a girl disappeared um, in a small village in Bavaria in Germany and was, was missing for a long time. Sometime after her disappearance, Ulfi K, who you can see on this picture here, was suspected by the police because he had exposed himself in front of a boy and masturbated. Ulfi K is intellectually impaired and therefore particularly vulnerable to making poor decisions and false confessions during interviews. Regarding the interviewing of Ulfi, we can say that um, until 2003, he was interviewed on a total of 40 days, so 40 days, and in the course of this, he was interviewed several times for several hours, for example, on one day for about nine hours with interruptions. In the case file, you can also find evidence for the use of risky, confession-oriented, ineffective tactics. And in this case, um, Ulfi confessed for the first time in mid-2002, but the body could not be found at the place he had named. In two more interviews, he had named other places, but the body could not be found there either. And shortly after his confessions, he retracted them and indicated that he falsely confessed to stop the police interrogations. Nevertheless, he was sentenced to life in prison in 2004, which shows the influence that also comes from retracted and verifiably false statements. 
Finally, he was acquitted in 2014 and in 2016, the dead body of the girl was found by a mushroom picker. So now the very important question, is this case an incident in or a coincidence? Let me just mention some of the research we did in Germany to answer this question. In two survey studies, we interviewed 153 and 280 convicted offenders and 16% of the patients and 4% of the offenders reporting having confessed falsely to the police. I would say this shows that false confessions are more common than one would initially expect. And it is worth noting here that when a suspect falsely confess to a crime, the actual perpetrator is regularly still out there. And I would say we can talk about an inefficient investigation then. Furthermore, an analysis by a colleague and myself revealed clues that untested or ineffective confession-oriented tactics were also taught in police training, at least until recently in Germany. I find this very surprising, especially when we think back to my comparison with the ineffective medication. So based on my insights into the international research, the practice in Germany and my own studies, I therefore developed an interactive training for interviewing suspects and witnesses. Its name is um, Interaktives Vernehmungstraining. I use practical and uh, interactive exercises in order to reduce the gap between theory and practice and the core content is investigative interviewing and the training is centered around the German version of the CTI training tool yet. During the last four years, I have trained over 300 um, police interviewers at different levels and from different crime areas and the demand and feedback is surprisingly high. I have asked some police officers and detectives of my trainings who contacted me from time to time to describe their view on interviewing and they said, for example, I've been working in the field of serious crimes for about 15 years, half of that time in the field of homicide. Apart from many other investigative approaches, interviewing is still one of the most important means in the investigation of the crime. In offenses with such high punishment expectations, there should always be a high standard of professional work and as such also of interview. In order to ensure this, interviewing needs to be open and effective, as also described in the Mendes principles, I would say. And another one said, since 2004, I have been working as a federal police officer and now in a leading position in a criminal police department and have been responsible for offenses such as smuggling of people or human trafficking. Frequently, criminal offenses cannot be solved only on the basis of physical evidence, but require the statements of the suspects and witnesses. This makes it clear why interviewers must master this extremely fragile instrument of interviewing. It is absolutely essential that the basic and further training of interviewers is based on the international fi scientific findings in this field and focuses on open-ended and non-coercive interviewing techniques, such as investigative interviewing and the use of techniques like PEACE or PECA. PECA is the German acronym of PEACE. And finally, um, I have been working in the field of homicide investigations for about 30 years, 20 of them in the leading of homicide units. For about three years, I have been conducting inter interview seminars for investigators in the field of homicides. Interviewing is the most demanding and important part of an investigation and is rightly called the crown of investigations among detectives. The investigative interviewing technique is the only way to have a fair interview and protects both and the suspects and the interviewers themselves. It also offers the best chance of obtaining a great deal of useful information. My wish would be for this interview technique to be taught to all police officers all over Germany, no matter in which field they work. However, we are miles away from this in Germany. I would say derived from these statements, we can say that investigative interviewing is very much appreciated by practitioners in Germany. And coming back to, my, to the question of my presentation, I would say that based on my insights, experiences and knowledge and the feedback of the practitioners, investigative interviewing can ensure and increase the efficiency of investigations in Germany. There has also been some slight interest in investigative interviewing from decision makers in Germany. However, 
I, or rather we, I would say the police practitioners and I, would be very pleased if in future decision makers would take up the matter more consequently. I think the willingness and motivation in practice exists. I'm convinced that the UNODC e-learning program presented today by Anna can play an important role in this context. It can be fruitful for self-study and training or for repetition and further training. With the necessary support, it can be an important step to optimize the interview practice in Germany, but this is only one step and many more are necessary, in my opinion, to close the gap to other leading countries and conduct interviews and investigations in an effective manner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing both your experience and the statements from senior law enforcement officers and, and your kind and positive feedback on the e-learning modules. And this is what I wanted to add as well, that of course the e-learning is just one step and one tool for countries to, to start using investigative interviewing or, and, and these methods. They would need a number to invest in this, first of all, deciding that this is going to be the method and then train their practitioners. E-learning can be a first step and introduction, or it can be, as you said, a refresher for those who have already gone through the training. It would require, of course, in-person training and practice, because we know that, especially in this area, the police officers, law enforcement officers need to practice, but the e-learning can be a first step to introduce the methodology. Um, so we've heard from all of you, both about the standard, about the need for this uh, this uh, practice, the positive feedback, both from the, the police academy in Pakistan that has piloted the training, your feedback, Leonard, uh, and I think we are sort of at the end of the event. Um, I wanted also to mention that we have done a pilot as well in Nigeria, which was also very positively uh, received by the participants. Uh, and we have done a peer review as part of the process of developing the, the training in order to make sure that it is relevant to different parts of the world. So we had peer reviewers from all around the world, both from law enforcement, from human rights agencies, police oversight bodies, uh, and from colleagues that work on specific types of crime, uh, for instance, trafficking or terrorism. Um, if there are no questions, uh, I think there are no questions. Again, maybe a last point on the platform, the uh, e-learning modules will be available to anyone who registers free of charge, so they're not re res restricted. You can fill out the form uh, that has been shared on the chat and uh, we will send you, as soon as the modules are live, which should be within a few days, we'll send you a notification that you can actually go through the training. And as we are towards the end, I will give the floor to Mr. Gerdele for a few final words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no final words except from uh, thanking you very much for this interesting presentation, but I was uh, still having a question. I was very curious, um, Leonard, uh, could you tell us uh, why there's a rate uh, four times higher of um, false confessions uh, within uh, patients in forensic institutions compared to uh, prisoners? And uh, what are the specific reasons for that? I think uh, the reason for this could be the vulnerability of the patients. So you have disorders or intellectually impaired and participants in the one study which you don't have in the other study. I would say this is the, 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 the best explanation for it. But these are only two studies. And I would also say that we would need more studies to have uh, really reliable uh, information and can draw strong conclusions on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, no, ju uh, just to add from us at UNODC again, thank you to the Norwegian Center and the permanent missions of Norway and Germany. And I would like to really encourage countries to reach out to us. And when I say us, it's all of us together uh, for uh, if you are interested in implementing this methodology, if you're interested in training, uh, 
Uh, NCHR also has a lot of experience providing in-person training, and we work with a number of other uh, partner organizations in this area. So we are very happy to have had uh, all of you here, and uh, we look forward to working, to continue working together. Thank you so much. Thank you.